Good evening. Good evening. I'm Larry Souter, and welcome to Stories of Amazing Grace. We're coming to you from Baxter Chapel at the Madison Church of Christ in Madison, Tennessee. Thank you for joining us on the internet. Some of you are viewing through Facebook, YouTube, praiseandharmony.tv, and also if you're listening through World Christian Broadcasting, we're on the radio through shortwave around the world. We've got plenty of options for you to tune in and listen or watch Stories of Amazing Grace. And if you happen to be in the Madison area, come visit us on the first Wednesday of each month, 6.30 here in Bixter Chapel at the Madison Church of Christ. We'd be glad to have you. Our theme scripture comes from Romans 8, 38 through 39 from the New Living Translation, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Guest tonight is John Mark Hicks. He's back with us. He was here a couple months ago. He is the professor of theology at Lipscomb University. And uh, he has too many degrees to mention. They would embarrass us if we listed all of them. So let's just say he's qualified. He knows what he's talking about. He has taught in over 40 states, 20 countries. He has authored, co-authored, edited, or contributed to over 40 books. He has contributed to both academic and popular journals. But tonight, we're going to discuss this book, Searching for the Pattern, My Journey in Interpreting the Bible. Well, what pattern do you follow or have you followed over the years? Um, in our tribe and in other tribes, has been command, example, necessary inference, and silence of the Scripture. But is that the best way? Is there another way? A way that's actually a story of amazing grace that's not based on rules, but based on a relationship with Jesus Christ. I think we'll find out that there is another way, and you'll meet John Mark Hicks right after this promo, which lasts about 90 seconds. Tell me about pimp. <laughs> oh, in the prayer. Yes, yes, yes. P-I-M-P. Yes. Okay. So, in your prayer life, you got to have a pimp. Now, I know we all Church of Christ people, we're going to clutch our pearls. And, oh, Lord, you're talking about pimps. <laughs> Look, now, this ain't the street pimp, okay? Calm down. This pimp is what I talk about in your prayer of having passion in your prayer. Passion in my prayer, P-I-M-P. Your dream travel destination is the Alps in Switzerland. Yeah. Guess what? What? You're going to send me there? No. What? What? Look at this. Brochure from Switzerland. Look, look at this. <laughs> look at these pictures. Uh, look at this. <laughs> what? What? Look at this. Yeah. Look over here. Take me there. Four thousand dollars. Yeah. We so can't, we can't afford that. <laughs> we can't afford that. We understand that your favorite restaurant is what? J. Alexander's. Well, are you in luck? Really? I can get it out. Are you in luck? Yeah. Gift card for Jay Alexander's. Really? Once you have that. And we got you a story of Amazing Grace mug here to take with you. Really? Yes, sir. You're a good man. I know. He really. That's all we could do. Please welcome John Mark Hicks. Come on up. Thank you. Good to see you, Larry. Good to see you. Good to see you again. Yeah. Glad you'd come back. It's a little warm in here tonight, so I'm going to be listening a little bit, and maybe uh, you will too. It's about to get hotter, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about your book. Uh, we didn't get to this last time. You hear, Searching for the Pattern, My Journey in Interpreting the Bible. Mm -hmm. Some say, the Bible says it, just do it. Kind of like a yeah. Nike slogan. But that uh, can be problematic, right? Have you had experiences along that line growing up? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if, if you think of it, in, the Bible says it, so then I reproduce it, and I make this one-to-one -one correspondence, then the danger is I'm going to reproduce first century culture because the Bible was written to people in a different language, in a different geography, a different historical moment, different situation, and so when the Bible is written to someone 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago, to just kind of make a one-to-one -one correspondence is you're in danger of reproducing that culture, not reproducing what God intends 
how God intends to shape us and form us into the image of Christ. So, for example, greet one another with a holy kiss. We don't reproduce that. What we do with that is we say, oh, there's a really important dimension of the Christian life where we recognize each other and we show love for one another and we welcome each other. And that's greeting one another. We don't go around kissing each other necessarily. Now, wouldn't necessarily be anything wrong with that if you wanted to do it that way. But, I mean, you didn't kiss me. We just shook hands, mm-hmm. right? And I'll give them, and Mike, that's good enough. That, Mike, you just had a hand cleaner over there. <laughs> there you go. So that's kind of the point that we look at what, what God is doing in that text. What is God intending in that text? How is God intending to form us and shape us into the image of Christ? And so we look for the mystery of Christ that is being articulated in that text. And it's the mystery of Christ that we want to embody and make it a part of our heart and life so that we can live in faithful ways. Where did we go off the tracks with, with all this? With the restoration movement or where? Well, I think it's, it's even larger than restoration movement, really. Um, Is it common in other fellowships as well? Yeah, I think this so. Blue, this blueprint in, in thinking? In different ways, in different ways. Okay. Uh, it's, it's treating the Bible like a, a legal document that we run a concordance through to find all the, the phrases that fit. And then we just accumulate these phrases and put them, we kind of put them on the wall and say, okay, there's a verse, there's verse number one. Let's go grab another one. Oh, there's verse number two. And let's go grab another one. Oh, there's verse number three. And then we kind of draw conclusions from that. And we draw more inferences from it. So we build this, we build this system. Because we've taken a verse over here, one over here, one over here. And we've collected them together. And we've created something that you couldn't find in the text. Not, not like that. We've created a, a blueprint for something that doesn't exist in the text. But we thought we've got the blueprint from the text. But what we did is we drew it from the text, put it on this board over here, rearranged them, drew more inferences, and created something that really isn't there. The five steps of salvation. It's not there in a list, right? Not in a list. But no. it is in our songbook. <laughs> well, we do create lists. In the front lists, of the songbook, we, there it we is. We do create lists. And we create lists like five steps of salvation or the three purposes of the church. or We create all kinds of lists because what we're doing is we are looking for something in the Bible that we can um, use as a blueprint for how we are to reproduce things today. Right? And we, that, takes, that makes the Bible into something that it really isn't intended to be. It, it's, the Bible is more of a story, a, a narrative, a story about who God is, and about what God is doing, and how God is calling us into participation in God's own mission. And when we take Bible verses and extract them from their context, and use them as kind of like building blocks to create something, it, let me give you this analogy. Suppose... Um, you're, you've entered a field, and someone says, now this field is scattered with building blocks. Well, you got to go find the block, take it over here to the other field, and start building something. So you go over to this field, and you look around. Maybe they're numbered, maybe they're not. Maybe it's hard to find which block goes where. And you take that block, and you put it over here, and what you do is you build a temple. You build a system. And then you live in that system and you obey the rules of that system and you feel safe and you feel secured and you feel comforted because I got the system. Now it's just a matter of working the system, right? And that's, sometimes that's on the easy side is to work the system. But that's not really what the Bible is. The Bible is more, this temple already exists. The Bible is the temple in that sense. That we explore the temple. We explore the story of God. And we breathe in the air of the story. And we take in the story by osmosis and through reading and through conceptions. And we become part of the story itself. And that's harder to live. Now it would be a lot easier if if God had said, I only want you to spend 25% on your house. (laughs) 
you know. If I had a rule like that, I'd say, oh, okay, I can do that. Um, well, I think maybe I can. But that's not how, that's, that's not the story God gives us. That's God, checklist you know, Christianity. Yeah, it, because the story God gives us is, I want you to be so in love with God and people that you have a generous heart. That you're going to manage your money in ways that reflect the generosity of God. And instead of having a rule about percentages, this is a matter of the heart. This is a matter of testing the heart. Are you really one who is connected to the story? Connected to who Jesus is? So it's not so much about rules that define whether you're in or out as much as it is do you have a sense of the heart to live out the story? To live out who God is in your own life and to follow and imitate Jesus. Yeah. Tell me about the Lord's Supper. They, uh, th that's something later we want to discuss <laughs> in yeah. more, more detail. But uh, I saw some comments in the book about we assume that we take it each, each Sunday. Mm -hmm. It's not really a command. No. The examples we have about the Lord's Supper is it was always on an upper level, and we don't do that. Yeah, it's an upper room, yeah. Upper mm -hmm. room. And it was always after a meal, is that right? Well, or a meal was in the middle of it, okay. yeah. Yeah, I mean, Jesus took the bread, and then after supper, he took the cup. So why did we pick and choose with this, you think? Well, that, that's a very good question. Uh, because when you're looking for this blueprint, you have to make decisions about, well, is that permanent or is that circumstantial? The fact that every instance in the, in the New Testament, the Lord's Supper is always in an upper room, is that just incidental or is that essential? The fact that you took the cup after supper, is that incidental or is that essential? Uh, the fact that it was always at night, is that incidental or is that essential? Um, and who, so do you, those who, who decides? Who decides? Yeah, who gets to decide that? Well, when you're looking for a blueprint, you have to make those decisions. And you have to make those decisions in ways that say, okay, this is right and this is wrong. Right? Or you have to say, this is what you have to have. The other you could have. You, don't, you could do it upstairs if you want. You can do it at night if you want. But you've got to have these. And that, that means you've got to have rules of interpretation that, make, that help you make those kinds of decisions. Like um, uh, a generic command includes all its specifics. Uh, but if you have a command that is parallel or coordinate with uh, the other command, then that's exclusive. I mean, you know. So when uh, Jesus takes, um, for example, some people in our tradition said when Jesus took the cup, that means there's only one cup. And there's only one cup, that excludes all the other cups. So we should have one cup, not multiple cups, right? Well, who, who gets it? I mean... How do you decide what is uh, an essential part of the Lord's Supper and what is not? Issues like that have divided the church. One of our elders several years ago put together a list yeah. of issues that have divided us. He's got 150 here, and he says there's a whole lot more. Mm. In music, praise teams or not. Music yeah. on videos, choruses, song leaders using a pitch button, types of songbooks used. Uh, theology area, this is your area. God as Father, Sovereign, Creator. Uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit, laying on of hands. Six days of creation to be taken literally. Fasting. Yeah. It goes on and on and on. Lord's Supper every Sunday. All worship functions performed by male members. Reverence to bread or loaf. And these things have divided us over the years. Exactly. Exactly. And, and one of the reasons is that we have been reading the Bible in order to generate a list a list of essentials. Or now, a list I, I know, of, I'm, yeah. maybe I'm harping yeah. on this, that that is true in the churches of Christ, what, I, what yes. I've experienced, not so much now in, in our fellowship here, but and maybe not, not at all here. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. have any broad strokes here. But uh, is that true of other religious groups? It has been. And um, what are some examples of that? So, for example, in the Reformation period, when Ulrich Zwingli became the reformer, in Zurich, Switzerland, right. he got rid of all the music because he didn't think that was in the New Testament. All the music or instrumental music? 
All the music. All the music. Because he didn't think congregational singing was part of the New Testament church. I see. Um, he got rid of all the statues. He was an iconoclast. Um, so the, what happened in the Reformed tradition, John Calvin, for example, was opposed to instrumental music. He was also opposed to using any words other than Scripture in the songs. All the songs had to come from Scripture, according to, to John Calvin. It was in, in the Reformed tradition, which is the Calvinists, Puritans, Presbyterians. In the Reformed tradition... Um, there was a, a thing called the regulative principle. That is, we're going to regulate our worship by the Bible. We're going to regulate our worship by the New Testament. And that means if it's not in the New Testament, we're not going to do it. And that principle was very much influential in churches of Christ, you know, in our, in our context. So we, weren't the only, we didn't invent this. We gave us some new twists and different things, but... Um, other traditions have also done. Did this. other traditions come to the correct pattern? <laughs> well, that's the that's the question, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, the Reformed Church, the Presbyterians came up with Presbyterian kinds of polity, church organization. Uh, they practiced infant baptism. They uh, they divided among themselves about the music. Um, so that's part of the problem. Is that when you're looking at the Bible through this lens? We come out of different places. And when you come out of different places using this lens, that means some people got the essentials wrong. And when they get the essentials wrong, then we can't have anything to do with them, right? Because they don't have the essentials right. And so division becomes part of the, the outgrowth or the outcome of this kind of way of reading the Bible. Because it all depends on getting it right. <laughs> we got to get it right. If we don't get it right, then we have no assurance we don't get it right, we won't get the right church with the right worship, with the right pattern, the right program. If we don't get it right, then we have no assurance, no security. Which means we put a lot of effort into getting it right. In terms of reading it right. And I grew up in Churches of Christ and I, I had such a wonderful experience growing up in Churches of Christ. It was such a, I felt loved, I felt secure. Um... My parents were wonderful parents. The churches I grew up in were wonderful churches. I never experienced a church split growing up. Really? Yeah, at all. Um, and so I had the highest value. I learned that the Bible is important in growing up. And I learned that the Bible is uh, a guide for us. And we need to read it. And we need to study it. And we need to follow its conclusions. We need to go where it takes us. And so I still believe that. I still believe that's true. The problem is, you know, what pair of glasses are you wearing when you read it? And what are you looking for when you read it? Am I, what am I looking for? Am I looking for, oh, I need the list. Mm -hmm. Is that what I'm looking for? Or am I looking for something else? And, then it, and that's where I think the shift for me has come in searching for the pattern. I'm still searching for a pattern. But now I'm looking not for a pattern with the list of things, that make it the right church. I'm looking for the pattern of God's activity in the world. So let's, let's use the illustration of, um, you know, the five acts of worship that are teaching and prayer and giving and singing and the Lord's Supper, right? Five. And, and we held that as kind of exclusive. No additions, no subtractions, right? Now, notice we got giving from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, which is Paul telling the Corinthians, he's answering a question. He says, now concerning the collection, that, that's Paul's phrase for saying, oh, now you, you asked this question, let me answer this question for you. Now concerning the collection, why don't you do it the way I told the Galatians to do it? Every first day of the week. You lay by in store, you, you, everybody sets aside a certain amount of money every first day of the week, and so that when I come, there won't be any collections. And what we did with that is that we made, we made that verse the basis for giving every first day of the week. And, we, it, and I grew up hearing, and I actually said on many occasions, so this is something that was true for me, we have been commanded every, to give to the Lord every first day of the week. The lay by in store. Yeah. Right, exactly, separate and apart, 
You know, that kind of thing. Right? So this was, um, this became one of the five acts of worship. It became one of the five as early as the 1870s. It, it started being one of the five. But when you look at the text in 1 Corinthians, that's not really what Paul's doing. He's not setting up a timeless pattern for how to give. Uh, in fact, if it was a timeless pattern, Paul should have said, Hey, I already told you how to do that. Why are you asking me again? You know, I already, when I was there, I set it up for you so that you could be a right church, a true church. But apparently they weren't doing it. And so they said, Paul, how are we supposed to make this collection? And then he told the Galatians to make it a certain way. He said, all right, Corinth, you follow that as well. But he didn't ask the Macedonians to do it. He only asked the Galatians and the Corinthians to do it. So it wasn't intended to be part of a pattern. It was, in, it was a special collection for the church in Jerusalem. And they asked, how, how, how should we go about that? Well, just put aside some money every first day of the week. And when I get there, it'll be collected. I don't have to make a special collection. We can, it'll just be ready. Now, think about, is that how Paul really wants us to think about giving? As some kind of pattern we follow in the sense of a rule that says every first day of the week, everybody needs to give a percentage of their income. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing to do. I think there's value to being communal in our giving and sharing our resources and to having a good rhythm for that. I, I, I like that rhythm of giving in my life so that every week I'm reminded that, hey, I need to be a person of this sort. But it's not kind of a requirement to be the true church. When Paul actually addresses this in 2 Corinthians, he doesn't say, now, you Corinthians, I told you to, to do this collection. And you're not doing it. He doesn't then lay down the apostolic kind of hammer and say, now, you need, just need to obey the pattern. That's not what he does. Not when he talks about, he's not talking about a blueprint pattern. What he does is he says, do you, do you really believe the story we're preaching? Um, it, it's not about, are you complying with the blueprint? It's, are you living in, out of the pattern of the life of Jesus? Because in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul uses the word grace 10 times. The most he uses it anywhere else. This is the highest concentration of the word grace in the, all the Bible. And what Paul is basically saying is, look, God grace to you so that you can grace others. And then they will give thanks. They will grace God. It's in a story of an amazing grace, right? Christians are generous not because they got some rule they got to follow or they have some kind of blueprint that they have to comply with in order to be the right church or the true church. Christians are generous because they are leaning into and living the story of, of God's amazing grace. It's, it, you know, in that context, Paul says, the one who was rich became poor. So that those who are poor might become rich. And Paul said, do you believe that story? If that's what God did for you, if that's what Jesus did for you, the one who was rich became poor for your sake, if you really believe that story, then you're going to be the sort of person who, being rich, will become poor for the sake of the other. And so the question is not, did you get the right list? Did you comply with the specific command? That's a part of the blueprint. In fact, Paul says, I'm not commanding you. I'm not going to command you. Because this is a test of your love. This is, a, this, is a, this is a character check. This is an integrity check. Do you really believe the story you confess? If you do, you will share. Just like God shared. Right? And it is that that Paul says in verse 13 of chapter 9. He says, this is an obedience to the gospel. You obey the gospel when you follow the pattern of Jesus' own life and activity. 
the pattern doesn't become kind of a, a, a constitution with five articles and six lists and some kind of blueprint for building your own structure over here. The pattern is looking at the work of God and the activity of God and what God has done and saying, I, I want to be a part of that. I want to live my life like that. I want to live worthy of the gospel. And the gospel is the pattern of Jesus Christ. It's the pattern of, of, of God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now, that's a big spiel, but, I, you know. Do we eliminate, command, example, necessary emphasis? Does that have a place within this pattern? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It does have a place because we do read commands and we read models and examples and we see good examples and bad examples. And we all, when, all interpretation involves inference of some sort. So, yes, we absolutely use those. Those are, those are a part of the text. The text comes to us with commands and comes to us with examples and it comes to us in, with things that it implies. So, absolutely. But here's the, here's the crux. How do we use that? How do we use those tools in order to obey the gospel of Christ? Do we use them as tools to construct a pattern that's not even there? To create a blueprint that's not even there? Or do we use those as a way of seeing how God is playing out the story? How God is living out the story? How God is pattering the story for us? So, for example, when Paul uses examples in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9... He doesn't, he doesn't use an example like, well, I told you, you know, what I told the Galatians are doing this first day of the week thing, so you guys need to do it too. He, he doesn't do that. What he does is, the one who was rich became poor. So that those who are poor might become rich. There's the pattern. And the pattern then is, is, is examples and commands are, can be used to see that pattern. So Jesus says, give, give to the poor. There's a command. But we see it in the life of Jesus himself because he is the one who was rich and became poor. So it's not like we're going to just abstract a few commands over here and we're going to put these 20 commands on the wall and, and whoever does that, you're good. No, it ain't that easy. <laughs> that would be easy. Um, no, it's be kind to the ungrateful. Like Jesus was. Give to the poor like Jesus did. That's the pattern that we're leaning into. And that's where we see commands and examples and inferences. So the difference is that some people, and I, I did and I learned um, in my, my own growing up and my own training and early history as a minister that I use commands, examples, and inferences to construct the pattern, to build a pattern. That once I completed it, you couldn't go back and say, well, there it is. I don't do that anymore. At least I try not to. I think sometimes I get into a default mode because it's just how I grew up and so on. Instead, I use commands, examples, and inferences to see how they reveal the work of God. How they illuminate the work of Jesus. How they illuminate who Jesus is. And what Jesus has done. And my call is to imitate Jesus. It is to follow Christ. And Christ is the pattern. Or the work of God in Christ by the Spirit is the pattern. And that's what I live into. And when I imitate that, Paul says, when you imitate that, you obey the gospel. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 13. Right. So, so it's a matter of looking at, well, how did Paul use commands, examples, and inferences? You know, Paul used the manna out of heaven as an example in 2 Corinthians 8. He said, now the manna is, um, is God's gift. And the manna is intended to be shared so that someone doesn't have too much and someone doesn't have too little. 
And that's how I think the church should work, right? And I think that's what Paul is saying. The church should be a place where somebody doesn't have too much when somebody has too little. We should share our resources. And we learn that from what God did in the manna. So Paul is uh, thinking about how to obey the gospel, not by thinking about some blueprint that he has to follow. He's thinking about God acting in the world on, for the sake of his people. And how do I follow that? How do I live out that? How do I embody the grace of God? And that's where the giving comes from. That's where the generosity comes from, embodying the grace of God. Not by a rule that we have to give every first day of the week. And how do we put flesh on that in regards to baptism, racial sure. division in the church? Uh, well, I think we can, yeah. Um, baptism is, goes back to Jesus, right? Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness, Matthew puts it. He, Jesus underwent a ritual designed for sinners. Jesus basically identifies with us and says, I'm going to go on the water with you. And if you want to be my disciple, you will follow me. I, I use this illustration quite a bit um, in terms of baptism as a, um, as a matter of following Jesus into the water. For example, I, uh, I had a student in one of my classes. Uh, this comes up often in my classes because we talk about all, we talk about the life of Jesus and we talk about who, how Jesus is our pattern and, and we talk about baptism. Um, and baptism becomes this kind of sore point for a lot of people, right? And this one young lady said, you know, I, 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 I haven't been baptized yet because I, I just don't think it's all that important. And, um, and a lot of people think of that as a work and a lot of people use it as a club. And I just don't, I just don't think I should be involved in, you know, something that people misuse, you know? And they said, you're, you're a disciple of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I follow Jesus. Yeah, you know, I'm a disciple. That means, that means you imitate Jesus, right? Oh, yeah, sure. Jesus is the one I imitate. Jesus went into the water. Maybe, maybe if you're a disciple of Jesus, you would follow Jesus into the water too. If Jesus went into the water, there must be something important about it. Uh, maybe we follow Jesus into the water. She was baptized the next day. Because she could see that point, right? That the, the significance of baptism and the importance of baptism as part of uh, the community of faith originates with Jesus' own action. And in that action, the Father says, you are my child, the Spirit anoints Jesus. And what we have in the baptism of Jesus is, in fact, our baptism. Because that's what happens to us when we are baptized, too. God says, you are my child. I am delighted with you. And anoints us with the Holy Spirit. When I baptize someone, I bring them up out of the water. And I put my hands over them. And uh, kind of symbolizing the dove, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And I speak the words of the Father. You are my child. I love you. I am delighted with you. Welcome into the kingdom of God. And that's just a matter of following Jesus. Now there's a lot more we can say about it. Because the, the baptism is also about the death and resurrection of Jesus. You know, there's, that's a theological sort of thing. So when we read the command to be baptized, and it is a command to be baptized. We see it in Acts 10, 48. We see it in uh, Matthew 28. So there is a command, Acts 2, 38. But the command isn't just kind of like an abstract test over here on the wall. said, check that one off. No, the command is situated in this story where we imitate Jesus and become one with the story of Jesus and follow Jesus and commit ourselves to Jesus. 
And God is affirming us and forgiving us and anointing us with the Spirit. It becomes a very important moment in our, in our life with God. Not because it's a command per se. Because it's a command that is enriched and ensconded within and part of the very story of Jesus himself. And so it really puts a different feel to it. You know, it's not like um, um, we just have a list of things to do. It's rather we have a story that we're going to embody. We're going to have a story we're going to live into. We're going to have a story that we become a part of. And in becoming part of that story, we then imitate God and imitate Jesus. And by the power of the Spirit, we obey the gospel. We become, we embody the gospel. We live worthy of the gospel, Paul says in Philippians 1, 27. So that's kind of how I would we think about baptism. We want to follow and obey because God first loved us. That, yes, exactly. That should be the motivation the, the, rather than the list. Jesus initiated it for us, right? right? Yeah. Before you comment on racial segregation, we read something from your book here, which I didn't know took place. As segregation within the church <clears throat> reared its ugly head in the 1870s, David Lipscomb, the editor of the Gospel Advocate, opposed it. In 1874, when the consultation of church leaders met in Murfreesboro, it passed a resolution that recommended, wherever practical, to withdraw themselves and form congregations of their own. This was referring to colored people right. withdrawing from the yeah, church. Yeah, that's their language, colored. Lipscomb opposed it. He labeled it destructive to the Spirit of Christ. I did not know that this took place years ago, but how would this... Uh, narrative pattern take care of this. Yeah, let me just comment on the historical part of that. Um, you know, after the Civil War, and even really kind of before the Civil War in Nashville, uh, there was a, a kind of um, two-pronged sense, two, two bases for having a, uh, an African-American congregation and uh, a white congregation. And one of those was if you've been an enslaved people, you probably don't want to still be under, under the authority of a bunch of white Christians, right? Especially the ones who enslaved you. So you have a tendency, okay, we want to have our own congregation. That's understandable. That's understandable. Um, then, but there was the other impulse that was, there was an impulse among some white churches that they didn't want to be, even though... Before the Civil War, most churches were black and white, at least in the cities. Uh, masters would bring their black, their enslaved people to the church with them, that kind of thing. And sometimes that, was, that worked well, sometimes not so. But, uh, but afterwards, uh, there was this sense of, that a lot of white people wanted to separate, which ultimately ended up being kind of Jim Crow and segregation and et cetera. So what was happening in Murfreesboro was uh, there was a, a movement to encourage churches to uh, encourage African-American members to plant their own churches. And David Lipscomb was adamantly opposed to that. He said that didn't happen in the New Testament between Jew and Gentile. They were a part of the same congregation, the same church. It shouldn't happen. Uh, because there's no Jew nor Greek in Christ. And there should be no forced separation of black and white in the, in the congregations. And so he was totally opposed to that. Um, but you know what, what happened, which is still clear today, right, in so many ways, um, particularly in the Jim Crow era, north and south, uh, black and white churches went on their different paths. And what was, what was kind of a unity in, in the 1860s became a total segregation by the 1920s. Now, is that gospel? Forced segregation? I don't think there's anything inappropriate with, with, with uh, congregations um, uh, having a sense of their own self, and especially African-American congregations wanting to have a kind of being, um, having good reason to, um, to avoid the situation of being under white power again. You know, you, I can understand that. 
But here's, here's the gospel goal, though. The gospel goal is that in Revelation 7, that every language, tribe, and nation is going to be before the throne of God. And if that's what heaven is, that's God's goal, right? And it's not in part of what God intends to do here. We go back to creation. Here's the kind of the theological reading, the narrative reading. Reading from creation. Every human being has the dignity of being created in the image of God. Every human being has been called into the mission of God to, to participate in the mission of God. To be fruitful and multiply and to subdue the earth and to have dominion over the earth. This is something human beings share and we all share that dignity. And we see it even in Israel. Israel, uh, Rahab became a part of Israel. She wasn't a Jew, right? She wasn't a child of Abraham, but she became part of Israel. Israel ex- received those from outside themselves and treated the aliens. Remember, uh, you were enslaved in Egypt. And I, God says, I loved you even though you were an alien in Egypt. You were a slave in Egypt, but I brought you out. And now... When you have people who are um, different from you, you receive them and you treat them and you love your neighbor. We see it in the story of Jesus. Jesus dies for all. I mean, racism goes to the heart of the gospel. It denies the heart of the gospel because Jesus died for all. That's kind of the feel. It's not like, where's the Bible verse that says... You know, racism is bad. Mm. You know, it's not the Bible verse that does that. It's the story. (laughs) It's the story of God's creation and God's goal and what Jesus did for the sake of all. And then loving your neighbor as yourself. Who's my neighbor? Well, if you have to ask, you got a problem. All right. If you have to ask. Remember the lawyer asked that question. Well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus gave that parable to Good Samaritan, right? Remember the lawyer's response? Well, you know, you got a point, but who's my neighbor? I got you now. Who's my neighbor? Well, I'll tell you who your neighbor is. Whoever's next to you. Whoever is a human being is your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. So racism is not so much, here are the five verses that condemn it, Here's the heart of God played out in the story that condemns it. And that, you know, it, it's, um, if you have a blueprint model, it's hard, to, it's hard to condemn. Now, we did in so many ways. In some ways, we didn't. I mean, that, it's a complicated history. But I think most people, you get, them in, you get them one-on-one, most people are going to tell you, yeah, we shouldn't treat people that way. Why? Because it's not the heart of God. It's not God's heart in creation. It's not God's heart in Jesus Christ. And it's not God's heart in terms of God's goal. All right? So it's the theological narrative. It's the, story. the pattern is who God is and what God is doing and how God has loved and how God is included and how God is done for all, right? He, God has acted for the sake of all. And if we're going to imitate God and we're going to imitate Jesus, then we cannot sanction in any way, form, or fashion a racist segregation or a racism of any sort. And that is the pattern. And that's the pattern. You did raise the question about every first day of the week yes. for the Lord's Supper. Yes. Uh, I don't think I addressed that at all. Okay. You know, we only have one verse that even mentions first day of the week and the Lord's Supper in the same context. Acts 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Well, that indicates, they, and they came together in the upper room and at night. So if you don't have, if the upper room and at night's not essential, why is the first day of the week essential? You know, why do we have to do it first day of the week? And why, why do we have to do it only on the first day of the week? The text didn't say only on the first day of the week. It just said it came together on the first day of the week. So that's when you start getting into, okay, what part is essential and what part's not? Um, and is there another way of thinking about that? 
I would suggest that we think about what the theology of the Lord's Supper is in terms of why first day of the week. When you look at Acts 20 and verse 7, the language is very similar to Luke chapter 24. When on the first day of the week, Jesus rose from the dead and he broke bread with his disciples. That's in Luke 24. The point is not so much, here's a pattern for how to do this. And if you don't do this, you're going to hell. Or if you don't do this, then you're not the true church. Rather, it's about this is the rhythm of Jesus' own resurrection. It is a first day of the week event. And you put together first day of the week resurrection and uh, breaking bread. And those three ideas are tied together in the story. It's not like there's a command or that this is a binding example. It's rather that these things hang together. That doesn't mean these are the only times you can do this. It's not the only time you can eat this meal with Jesus. In Acts 2 verse 46, they were breaking bread daily in the, at their homes daily. So it's, it's not that it's an exclusive. It's rather that the meal is a testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. It proclaims the Lord's death as well. But it's a testimony of the resurrection of Jesus. It's the meal that Jesus gives us and says, Come sit at my table and experience new life. Experience the gospel. The table becomes a place where we experience the gospel as the body and the blood of Christ. It's the moment when we sit with the living Christ who is the host of the table. And if he is the living Christ and he's hosting a table, don't you want to be at that table? <laughs> that table becomes a place of joy and celebration and comfort and security and assurance. Yeah, I want to go to that table. Every week I want to go to that table. On the first day of the week because that's when Jesus was raised. That doesn't mean it's the only time we can do that. But it means it is a very appropriate time to do that. So we don't, we don't find this command in the New Testament, do this every first day of the week and only on first day of the week. What do you have to, to get to that conclusion? You have to have a lot of other rules of interpretation that make inferences one after the other to finally, oh, we get to the conclusion. You have to have a series of inferences to get there. We make it too, we make it too complicated. It's as simple as Jesus invites us to come to the table to experience the gospel. And we proclaim the gospel when we get together. And we gather on the first day of the week because it is the day in which Jesus was raised from the dead. And therefore we meet together at the table. And if Sunday is the day we come together to proclaim the gospel... Why would we not sit at the table, which is the gift of God, to commune with us? If we're going to assemble on the first day of the week in order to proclaim the gospel, we ought to eat at the table on the first day of the week to experience the gospel. So it's that sort of argument. It's not like, oh, it's, one of the li- it's on the list, see? Just, you got to check that off. It's more, it's part of the story. It's not on the list. It's, on, it's in the story. What feedback or kickback have you received from people who follow the blueprint pattern as opposed to the narrative pattern? Yeah, uh, and it's understandable. I mean, this is, uh, this is quite a shift for many people. And it's, um, it's one that um, is not immediately apparent to a lot of people. Um, and they're, they're very convicted about how they approach things. Uh, in defending the blueprint model. They think that the narrative model is just a little too loosey-goosey, you know. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not as sure, it's not as certain, it's not as secure. Uh, but we don't find security in doing the right things. We find security in the story of God. That's where we find security. I think one of the interesting challenges for all of us is that you have to interpret Scripture and make decisions. Sure. And just like there would be people with a narrative view that would come up with different ways of thinking about things that, than you are. So it's mm-hmm. not like if you had the narrative approach, 
Therefore, you come out the same place. So exactly. I think what that means is, for all of us, when we interpret Scripture, there needs to be humility. It is about humility. It is about the fact that everybody interprets. It's not like, oh, it's just there. You know, everybody interprets. And, and yes, even blueprint people disagree what's in the blueprint, right? And narrative, people are going to disagree about what's most important in the narrative or exactly how to live out the narrative. Yeah, that's going to happen. So here's where the unity can happen. The unity doesn't come in that we have the same outcome with blueprint or that we even have the same outcome with narrative. The unity comes in what we actually confess God is doing among us. The unity comes in confessing that God created the world and that God sent the Son and the Son was born of the Virgin Mary and the Son ministered to people and the Son died for our sins and was raised from the dead and was exalted to the right hand of God and poured out the Spirit upon us who dwells in us and liberates us and transforms us and gifts us for the ministry, for participating in the ministry of Jesus until Jesus returns. That's the story. Yeah. And that's the story we can, we can all share, blueprint or narrative. We can all share that story. The problem comes when we, when we think that we got the blueprint so right, or we got the narrative so right, that if you're not just like me, you're on the outs. As a retired teacher of reading in English, to mm. me, one of the words that makes sense is when you read and understand context. Sure, context, right. You've got to know what it was like back then. you got to mm -hmm. understand the, the Eastern mind. I mean, more and more, I, I just see more things. Yeah. If, I just, if we just looked at it in this way, yeah. uh, then, oh, there's a whole other yeah. conclusion. Oh, that's really important, context, because there's a historical distance between us and the text, right? It's 2,000 years old, and culture's different, etc. So, yeah, it's really important that we have a sense of that distance, that we read it in context, that we just don't abstract a sentence out and put it over here on the billboard or put it on a bumper sticker, you know. Because when you put it on a bumper sticker, it gets a new context. It, you've taken it out of its con the context in which it g is given meaning, and we extract it out and we put it on the bumper sticker, and now it has a new meaning because it has a new context, yeah. Thank you for your conversation and perspective. Um, what really caught me tonight was the discussion about race in the church. Sure. Obviously, being African American, that's been a thought in the back of my mind. And I always wondered what the position of the church was during the civil rights movement. My late father used to take me to 11th Street Church of Christ, which is a predominantly white congregation. And I grew up going there in Hart Street, which is predominantly black. And I caught myself at certain times in my life saying I go to a black church. Yeah. I would give it the title black church, which there is no black church. And it seems like it should be more conversations about race relations in the church. And I'm glad you brought it up tonight. Uh, thank you. I, I agree with you. We need to have more conversations about that for sure. <clears throat> Honest, intimate conversations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I wonder how many church issues would go away, 150 or more, <laughs> if we embrace the narrative. Well, if we embrace the humility, it wouldn't matter those yeah, differences, right? Yeah, that's true. Right? That's true. Mm -hmm. we if we were, truly, we were truly caught up in the mm -hmm. story of yeah. God's amazing grace right. in our life. Thank you for being with us and uh, take time to share your story of Amazing Grace with some of this week. We'll see you next time. Thank you.